There appears to be no end in sight for the surge of interest in activities surrounding cryptocurrencies. The opportunities are intriguing, but as often happens, the regulators are trying to catch up to the technology and innovation. During a recent U.S. Senate Agriculture Committee hearing, the chair of the CFTC, or Commodity Futures Trading Commission, made the case that his commission should have jurisdiction over crypto. Jones Day's Josh Sterling and Dave Aaron are here to weigh in. Stay here. I'm Dave Dalton. You're listening to Jones Day Talks. Dave Aaron recently joined Jones Day as a counsel in its financial markets practice based in the Washington, D.C. office. He most recently served as special counsel in the Division of Data at the U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission, or CFTC, where he played a key role in writing a number of Dodd-Frank Act implementing regulations. He also served as liaison and provided significant assistance to the CFTC's Division of Enforcement in multiple swap rules-related investigations. You'll hear more about Dave's background and experience in a moment. And Jones Day's Josh Sterling has more than 20 years' experience in the derivatives and security markets, both as lead counsel to major companies and as a senior federal financial regulator. Josh represents clients that are active in the derivatives markets with matters before the U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, and various self-regulatory organizations, including the National Futures Association and the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Prior to joining Jones Day, Josh was director of the CFTC's Market Participants Division, which regulates 3,300 banks, intermediaries, and asset managers registered with the agency to trade derivatives in the U.S. markets. Josh, Dave, thanks for being here today. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Dave, let's go to you first. First of all, welcome to Jones Day. You're relatively new to the firm. Tell us a little bit about your background and some of your experiences prior to coming here. Sure. Well, I'm super excited to be here and working with Josh. I am a derivatives lawyer from way back. Started uh, MetLife in-house out of law school. Mm -hmm. Did a wide range of investment work there. And I moved to, to Citibank, where I supported primarily the equity derivatives trading desk, but also some of the credit derivatives guys and little backup with the interest rates, FX, and commodities. And then I moved to the CFTC the first time for a couple of years. I worked directly for the division director. And, and back then, kind of the current operating divisions were all wrapped up into one. So it was, it was a pretty great gig. And then I was recruited from our former chief counsel, Susan Urban, to go work with her at Deckert. My first law firm stop. We did mostly CPO and CTA work and also some OTC derivatives for representing funds, fund complexes, registered and also hedge funds. Then I was recruited to McDermott, where I did a lot of gas and power, physical energy trading, and, and some other commodity work and CFTC regulatory. And then I went to Schulte up in New York, where I did credit derivatives, CDS on CDOs, and helped cause the financial crisis, unfortunately. Uh, but, and when that blew up, I was at the UN for a couple of years, and then I got to undo some of my evil by going back to the CFTC and helping write the Dodd-Frank rules. Okay, okay. Fantastic. And I was there for too long, and I, I missed my chance to come uh, join Jones Day many years back, but thank God I'm here now, and I'm having a great time. Interesting background. What do you expect to be your client focus? What sort of matters will you be working on here at the firm? Well, anything Josh wants, but a lot of trading platform registration with the CFTC. There's a couple of different categories of DCMs and CEFs and some renewable energy derivatives. Like Dixon Chin's got some interesting work there. Factional derivatives work down the road, I believe. Uh, some security based swap regulatory work with Peter Petraro and oh, and, and crypto. We've already had some interesting crypto questions. And that's kind of the, the broad range uh, about right now. Well, you've certainly arrived here at an interesting time, and I, I thank you again for joining our program today. So let's jump into our topic. Josh Sterling, let's get going here. During a February U.S. Senate committee hearing, CFTC Chairman Rustin Benham said that speculative fervor surrounding cryptocurrencies has potentially left investors in need of protection. What sort of problems is the chairman worried about or perhaps maybe anticipating? Thanks for that, Dave. Again, it's always great to be here. And, and I've got to say that, uh, you know, we missed the part of David Aaron's resume where he said he caused the financial crisis. And uh, <laughs> we will not turn him into the relevant authorities. I think the statutes uh, run on that. So we just broke a major story here, Joe. Uh, <laughs> right. Um, come here first. So uh, on to the hearing. Yeah, I thought it was an especially 
powerful and helpful hearing for the public debate on regulation of digital assets. The chairman, uh, Russ Benham, was quite right to focus on customer protection concerns. Those are a core to the mission of any markets regulator like the CFTC. Some of the concerns he has break down along the following lines. First of all, there's a concern about people not understanding the products in the markets that have been approved and in the markets that the CFTC regulates. So whether it's trading futures on Bitcoin or investing in a fund that trades futures on Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency, there can sort of be an investor concern around that, investor protection concern, customer concern. The other issue is if you're buying and selling the tokens themselves, which I think is way more prevalent than say futures trading on tokens, if you're buying and selling those, there are opportunities for people to be taken advantage of, the CFTC as well as the SEC, and frankly, criminal authorities. Case announced just a couple of weeks ago where they uncovered a $4.5 billion crypto heist. And there's real opportunities out there for theft or to put your money into a system under false pretenses and someone absconds with the money. So I think he's worried about that as well. And a particular concern there too, I can't recall whether he mentioned it, but certainly the other current remaining commissioner, Commissioner Stump, has said, we need to police these markets for the tokens themselves. But remember that we, the CFTC, regulate the derivatives markets. So futures on crypto, futures on anything, we regulate with those markets. We do not regulate and require registration of markets where the crypto itself trades. And we don't want investors, customers who buy and sell tokens to think the CFTC is walking that beat like it does say, Chicago Mercantile Exchange or a futures exchange. There are concerns on a lot of levels out there. They want to do their job. They want to police for misconduct and they have the tools to do that in the sort of cash or spot market for tokens themselves. But they don't want to create the impression that there's this comprehensive federal scheme out there to regulate that because there's not. There's a bit of a, a DC a jurisdictional battle going on over, you know, which regulator or regulators might get a piece of that market to regulate. Sure. Josh, when we talk about these things, we always come back to consumer protections, and that's what commissions and agencies are there to do. Crypto is so new. Not to you guys, maybe, but to, to people like me, to typical investor, consumer, the guy out there, this is still new. Is much of the problem just because people don't know enough about it yet? They get excited. They hear about this stuff. There aren't inherent defects, if that's the right word, in these products. There's no malfeasance going on. It's just that maybe people don't understand what they might be getting into or doing sometimes. Is that where the protection comes in? There are, unfortunately, some notable cases where people have lost their money digitally. It was just sort of taken, taken by malefactors. So that's certainly a concern, but there is sort of this abiding customer protection concern. I mean, we're, we're living now with 80 plus years, 90 plus years of regulation and the securities laws. Commodities laws are about that old too. It does have very much a customer protection focus in, in that those laws sort of came of age and are still relevant today, of course, where you sort of have a market, which is a place where people go or log in now. They're mostly electronic, of course, to trade. And it's centralized. You have intermediaries you trade through, say a broker, an investment advisor, you're opposite a dealer, you go on an exchange and your trade is cleared. And at each of those points, there's regulation. And where the money is kept, say it's in a bank, there's regulation there too. And it can be federal, state, or both. Yeah. Well, you get into crypto land and everything's on a blockchain. These are essentially smart contracts. It's all zeros and ones. It is quintessentially disintermediated. That's one of the distinguishing characteristics of it. Right. For good or ill. And so who does what and how do you get them? Now, in the criminal case and civil enforcement case, so forth, because these blockchains are all public, matter of public record, all the transactions, you can run it down. The FBI has gotten pretty good at that, for example. But along the way, it's not as if you can call up as easily, say, a broker as you can in securities land when you have a concern about insider trading or someone manipulating a market or something. And that's the concern, too. How do you police it? Because it's very much decentralized. Sure. I guess that's inherent to the process. Let's go back to David Aaron for a second. Dave, the way the law is currently written, the CFTC can regulate derivatives like futures and swaps, but not cash or spot markets. What would have to happen to give the CFTC this authority to regulate the cash and spot markets? 
They do have authority to pursue fraud and manipulation, even in the cash slash spot markets right now and in crypto and other commodities in the past. So they've got some experience with that, but Congress would have to change the Commodity Exchange Act to grant them that day-to-day -day authority, like to, to require trading platforms of spot crypto to register in, in X category, maybe an existing one or a new one. It's been a long road already with Congress trying to pass a number of bills. A number of bills have been introduced over the last several years to do that or to give the SEC authority or to give them joint authority. Right. But historically, CFTC and the SEC haven't always played nice together and there's turf battles. I mean, they do try. It's not malicious in any way, but it's very difficult. I mean, just to know where the, the line is to agree with another agency on it. And then they don't even have, it's just based on today's authority. Well, in fact, that segues nicely into the next point because Josh, we've talked on previous podcasts about regulatory and enforcement powers given to the SEC, the Justice Department, and even state regulators and authorities, why might the CFTC potentially be the right choice to provide oversight for the cryptocurrency matters? Dave Aaron makes a great point. It's a great question, Dave. So there has been a discussion out there about whether the CFTC would be the right regulator for the cash markets and digital assets. And that was the thrust of the hearing last week. Some of the arguments in favor of the CFTC being given this jurisdiction, perhaps on an exclusive basis, would be that the regulator is very much focused on having clear principles around which its regulations are formed. And what that allows it to do is to sort of pursue new areas along the lines of those specific principles that they have, being a principles-based regulator. And I think that's very helpful when you get into an area with evolving in new technologies. Some of these technologies will be used by existing financial services firms. Some of the technologies ultimately might replace some of those firms. And I'm not here to make a prediction, but I can see both being possible. And if that's true, working with a regulator that's focused on principles can be quite helpful. That would be one of the arguments. So there's a degree of flexibility. And I don't mean this in an inappropriate way, there is a, a culture of learning at the CFTC and a willingness to understand new products. This is not capitulating to whatever business wants. Far from it, I can assure you, and I'm sure Dave can as well, but rather to try and work and find a, a solution. And I guess the final thing I would say is that where there isn't a solution, if the answer is no, it will be cleared and it will be understood and people might not like it, but ultimately they can live with it. The final reason is that when the CFTC is policing the markets for misconduct, it will laser focus on true misconduct where there is a disruption to pricing, meaning a manipulation of the market or a deliberate disruption in the market, where there's fictitious trading or uneconomic trading. It'll focus like a laser on that and it'll bring a pile of bricks down on someone. When you have violations or issues under sort of more technical rules, rules that are intended to keep everything moving in the right direction, you need to have timely reporting. You need to have appropriate capital levels, all those sorts of things. There are penalties for noncompliance and noncompliance is real. You've violated or allegedly violated federal law, but the penalties are not meant to shut down businesses. The penalties are not meant to send any more message than this conduct was wrong and everybody needs to know about it. In contrast to some other regulators, when the CFTC goes to bring a case and assess penalties, there is a definite effort to sort of tie the scope of those penalties and remedial measures to what actually went wrong and how bad it was. And I'm not sure that's always true with every other regulator today. Yeah, we've heard those stories. And just to rewind for a second, I liked what you said about this being an institution that keeps the ball between the 40s, because we recorded another podcast recently with one of your partners. And he yep. was talking about their whims, political whims sometimes, depending on how the commission or how the committee or whatever is stacked, you know, that can affect enforcement and policy going forward. So I like what you said about the CFTC as a regular guy out there, an investor, a consumer, 
that's a great way to, to see this and stuff we like to hear more of. Let's go back to Dave for a second. Talking about this, regulations and so forth, and whether or not we keep it in the 40s and who does it, it does seem like players in the crypto space are getting used to the idea or even warming to the idea that at least some federal oversight might be necessary. Now, Dave, is this something that could happen quickly, be it with the CFTC or some other commissioner agency, based on your experience? In our dreams, maybe. <laughs> Josh and I have talked about this. Josh has heard that it might take another few years to get everything together because to date, it's kind of been Congress looking to the regulators and passing some bills or not passing, introducing some bills, but unfortunately they haven't passed with all kinds of creative approaches, a new regulator, SEC and CFTC work together, just the CFTC, just the SEC. And then the regulators are asking Congress, the, the market regulators, the CFTC and SEC have been asking Congress for clear authority in certain areas. Russ Benham's just suggested that the CFTC would be comfortable taking on the spot market authority, but with a bigger budget, of course, because it's a much bigger ask. So uh, I don't think it's gonna happen anytime soon. The regulators could put out some more guidance, but they can't give themselves more authority. Or sometimes they try and then they lose in court and somebody pushes them on that. I don't know what exactly it's gonna take. There've been a number of hearings, including recently, where Congress tries to educate itself or make some points in public about what, they're, what they care about. And just, we haven't really gotten enough momentum. We just have to wait and see, I guess, or lobby. <laughs> I, I remember that the Wall Street Journal ran an article the day after this Senate Ag Committee hearing. CFTC, it's gonna be a hundred million dollars that, that they like to help with regulatory and enforcement work. And I know that's not a lot of money by Washington standards, but does that figure sound right to you, Dave, based on your experience? I know it takes a lot to do this right, 100 million bucks though, right? It doesn't even sound like that much when you think about it, because I think the budget is like, I mean, it'd be nice if I had it, but uh, yeah, right. for the agency, they have about a 400 million something budget approximately anyway. So to take on this huge space with like a trillion or three trillion, whatever the uh, interest is, it, it doesn't seem unreasonable. Depends what your view is of big government or not, but sure. if they're going to take on a whole huge new market like this, then they, they definitely will need new people and people with different experience coming in from industry and that costs more. So. It doesn't seem out of right. reality. Well, and Dave, thanks for that, because again, you lead me very well into the next question, because Josh, I'm thinking if this does happen, if the CFTC has granted this sort of authority, this would be a significant extension of that authority because the sheer size of the crypto market and also due to the fact that CFTC has primarily regulated only derivatives. Is this a fair assessment or am I making inferences I shouldn't be making here? I do think it would be a significant expansion of the authority which is sort of a, an odd position to be in to say that because if you look at the definition of a commodity commodity exchange act it starts out saying pretty much anything in the world except two things onions and motion picture box office receipts and so <laughs> literally anything is a commodity provided that there is or in the future will be a, a derivative on it i'm extemporizing here so that's very broad but then you get into well, what actually does the statute regulate and these are widely regarded derivatives as the largest financial markets in the world. But to get to the underlying thing and regulate it substantively, rather than just policing for fraud or requiring the collection of information would be significant. It's significant in the following sense. One of the things I always like to do is tell new lawyers that derivatives contracts are worthless. And they say, well, what, what are you talking about? You just told me it's a 30 trillion notional market for swaps. And I say, well, they're basically a thought or a guess about what a price is, and it could expire and it could be worthless. So there's mm -hmm. no intrinsic value to it. It's not an asset that appreciates or depreciates. It's not a store of value. It's not a unit of account. It's not a method of exchange. And crypto can be all of those things. It's a smart contract. It's totally composable. You can make it do very many different things financially that you want. And that's not a derivative. It's a thing that has real value. And so you'd have to create a market or a scheme to regulate markets and intermediaries that exist today, by the way, around things that have intrinsic value. There's sort of the size issue and the budgetary issues, which Dave hit on, but there's also just this conceptual issue of, you go from regulating basically price markets, what is the futures market saying about the price of cotton is, to regulating a market, which is, this is a Bitcoin or an Ether or Cardano, whatever it might be, 
what is that worth? Well, it's worth something. And now we have to police a market like that. So I think even conceptually, it's a bigger lift beyond the, the size of the actual market itself. Good enough. Dave, Josh, this has been great. Let's wrap up with this. Lastly, go to Josh first, then to Dave. Let's finish with this. What's the main takeaway from the Senate Ag Committee hearing of a few weeks back and Commissioner Benham's remarks? What does the audience need to know? Sure. The hearing was excellent. And I think that it is showing that the Senate Agriculture Committee, which oversees the CFTC, the CFTC itself feel that they have a valuable and constructive role, maybe even a primary role in regulating the digital assets marketplace and ecosystem. That's an important message to get out there. There's been a lot of talk from other regulators about how they're best equipped to do it, perhaps because their chairman have taught a course on this in a college or something like that. But I, I sort of see here the deliberate, thoughtful, and really well-grounded approach to getting legislation, getting regulation to follow it, being really focused on getting it right rather than being first. That's a great credit to the committee as well as to Russ Benham and the leadership and the whole team there at the CFTC. So the CFTC and the Ag Committee are in the debate and have a very strong hand. Dave Aaron, finish us up. What would you add to what Josh said? It's fascinating that the CFTC is in play to be the primary regulator of a cash market. That's big news and it, there seems to be somewhat wide support in the industry for that. Not surprising given the different approaches the CFTC and SEC have traditionally taken. I mean, SEC is really at its core as a, you know, a retail protection agency and CFTC is sometimes focused more on promoting innovation. So it's not surprising. It'll be interesting to see the SEC's oversight committee. I'm not sure they want to just see the Ag Committee have oversight over such a huge market without the SEC having input and thus they will become less important. So probably a lot of lobbying is and needs to happen behind the scenes and education and just also persuasion and to convince the relevant legislators why the CFTC is the best regulator for this job. All right. Great summation. Great conversation. We will leave it right there. We're at a fascinating time with all this. I'm sure we'll talk to you both again, but Josh, Dave, thanks so much for being here today and we'll talk again soon. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. You can find complete biographies and contact information for Dave Aaron and Josh Sterling at jonesday.com. While you're there, visit our insights page for more podcasts, videos, publications, blogs, newsletters, and other valuable information. Subscribe to Jones Day Talks at Apple Podcasts or wherever else podcasts can be found. Jones Day Talks is produced by Tom Condolis. I'm Dave Dalton. As always, we thank you for listening. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you for listening to Jones Day Talks. Comments heard on Jones Day Talks should not be construed as legal advice regarding any specific facts or circumstances. The opinions expressed on Jones Day Talks are those of lawyers appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect those of the firm. For more information, please visit jonesday.com.